Hello, and welcome to the inaugural Carl and Anne Braden Memorial Leadership Development Forum that features Anne as an educator at Northern Kentucky University. I'm Corey Pickering, and I am honored to be hosting today's program. We're here today to celebrate and uplift the legacy of our movement for mother, Anne McCarty Braden, and her husband, Carl Braden. I'd like to briefly share how Anne's legacy has touched my life as a fellow white anti-racist woman organizer born in Louisville, Kentucky. Growing up in de facto segregated Louisville in the 1980s and 1990s, I was raised in the colorblind ideology that whatever racialized disparity or difference I noticed, I was not to talk about it, name it, or ask questions about it because it would be rude. White adults in my life told me that we were supposed to treat all people the same, no matter their skin color. But they showed me that we were to be served by Black people and we were not to share space, particularly intimate space, unless in a servant employer dynamic. Beyond these tacit dictates, I learned about a few African-American heroes like Miss Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and of course, Muhammad Ali, who was a hometown hero. But these people were presented as one dimensional, exceptional figures on a sidebar in my American history textbook. Given this racial education, it's not surprising that I never learned of Anne and Carl Braden in the 19 years I spent in Louisville. The Bradens were integral to the civil rights movement of the 1960s. They were tireless, nationally known racial justice organizers from my own hometown. They regularly challenged and were punished by the system. I understand now that to white upper middle class people, to that world I was born into, the Bradens were the enemy. I was not to know that I was and am part of a power arrangement that advantages me and people like me. And so I was not supposed to know about the Bradens and their work either. When one of my white anti-racist mentors, Reverend David Billings, whom you'll hear from, from a little later, taught me about the Bradens, and I began reading Anne's work, I was both humbled and thrilled. I learned that Anne and Carl talked and wrote about white supremacy and racial capitalism beginning in the 1940s and fought against it their entire lives. Carl Braden served seven months in prison for treason. The charges brought against him for helping to integrate Andrew Wade, a World War II veteran and his family into a white Louisville neighborhood. Today, I'm an anti-racist educator, teaching both adolescents and future teachers, as well as an anti-racist community organizer in Brooklyn, New York. Anti-racism for me is a way of living and being. As the Bradens modeled, this is an everyday practice to recognize my position within our racialized society. My responsibility then as a white anti-racist is to sustain my commitment to undoing systemic racism by acting strategically to disrupt and transform it. I stumble, offend, feel uncomfortable, and make mistakes every single day. I even question my commitment to anti-racism when I experience myself or my white children unable to authentically connect with other white families who do not yet, yet recognize our role in our racialized society. Fortunately though, Undoing racism is a collective, collaborative, and even spiritual endeavor and practice. Anne wrote frequently about finding joy in struggling together. 
I'm learning from our movement elders and ancestors that we are not alone. Anne was a prolific letter writer, keeping up correspondence and relationships for decades with friends and acquaintances all over the country. She understood that we have to push against the white supremacy cultural norms of individualism, isolation, competition. She teaches us through her writing and her lived example that we white people must take leadership from black people, but also work with our white siblings to challenge the system and our internalized superiority. In her writing, in pictures and footage of the Bradens, you feel their joy and their playfulness. Anne's desire to connect with other human beings and push herself to live more fully and deeply is present in all of her work. She writes honestly, too, of the frustrations and fear and loneliness, but always comes back to the joy. We need the Braden's legacy to know that we are standing on the shoulders of giants, known and unknown, and that their work and spirit lives on in us. I want to thank Dr. Michael Washington and Amari Johnson for inviting me to connect, remember, and share the Braden's legacy through this project. And now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the person whose educational project gave birth to the Carl and Ann Braden Memorial Leadership Development Forum, Amari Johnson. Hi everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join us for the Carl and Ann Braden Memorial Leadership Development Forum. My name is Amari Johnson, and I am a sophomore studying history at Northern Kentucky University with minors in Black Studies, English, and Entrepreneurial Studies. And I have the chance to speak with immense pleasure and humility today, so thank you once again for taking the time to join us. I was first introduced to the richness of Black history during my first year of college. It was in my introduction to Black Studies courses that I took with Dr. Michael Washington that I became submerged in the beauty of Blackness and the importance of it being taught and spoken about in institutional spaces. It was in the comforting space of this classroom where I was fed knowledge that I had no idea existed. Over the following semesters, I enrolled in Black Studies courses and eventually declared it as one of my minors. In these classes, I have learned the importance of not just being an anti-racist, anti-discriminatory, and anti-bigoted person, but the importance of living as an undoing racism agent of social change. There's a difference that must be acknowledged here. There is no accountability in simply being against racism. Equitable social change demands action and accountability. These are just a few things that I have learned from Dr. Washington's classes and meetings with community activists and social change agents. This forum, this forum is an example of accountable action taken to create and sustain an important legacy. With this forum, it is the goal of all involved to make people aware of the importance of sustaining the struggle against white supremacy, which is maintained by institutional gatekeeping. For instance, in my brief time as a student at NKU, I have seen a decrease in support for Black Studies courses by the administration. Limited promotion of the program from the director resulted in the cancellation of my fall class. I did an independent study to make up for it, however, but the cancellation spoke volumes. The Black Studies program director has provided limited access to the discipline and students were unaware of his role as the director of the Black Studies program until he got promoted to Assistant Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. What is a Black Studies program without equitable inclusion in the, curr in the curriculum, a committed director, and support from the university? This is what we consider institutional gatekeeping because Anne Braden taught in the Black Studies program until the week of her death in 2006, and it appears that there is no effort being made on the part of the institutional personnel to sustain it as a viable program for the students, let alone to honor Ms. Anne Braden. For this reason, 
fueled by the inspiration of Carl and Anne, who were radical agents of social change because they challenged white supremacy, this forum was created to honor their legacy. Anne Braden was a teacher and a white anti-racist activist from Louisville, Kentucky. She made it her life's work to fight discrimination, institutional gatekeeping, and white supremacy. It is imperative that we keep her legacy alive as it is the backbone of what we as activists and community organizers stand for. With that, I'd like to thank Corey Pickering and John Stone for being accountable to me in making this project possible and for holding me accountable for my role in the endeavor. I challenge all under the sound of my voice to take time to reflect on what it means to be an agent of social change, to challenge the institutional practices that contradict the words and statements of faculty and staff. It requires courage and a willingness to fight. Change does not happen overnight, but with small, consistent steps, it can be done. And that is the purpose of today's program. Again, thank you for your interest in our inaugural event, which we envision as the beginning of a tradition of honoring our ancestors. I would now like you to give your undivided attention to the current president of the Student Government Association at Northern Kentucky University, who is also a resident of Louisville, as he offers his remarks on the Ann Braden Scholarship here at NKU and the importance of honoring the Bradens. Without further delay, President Daniel Myers. I knew Ann Braden from the mid 1970s until her death in March 2006. Of course, I knew of her before then. She was an icon of the civil rights movement. I was aware she was mentioned by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter from a Birmingham jail, which was written in April 1963. I had heard how she and her husband, Carl Braden, were from Louisville, Kentucky, and both had been charged with sedition by the state of Kentucky for buying a house in a segregated white neighborhood of Louisville and then selling it to a black couple. The Bradens were convicted under state sedition statutes, and Carl Braden actually served time. One of the things I have never forgotten about Ann is how throughout her life she stood by Carl. She would say, Carl and I were a team. I just happened to have lived a much longer life, but we were a team. I became better known. Had Carl lived as long as I have, we would have been, both been well known. 
I first met Anne at SOC meetings. SOC was how everyone referred to the Southern Organizing Committee for Economic and Social Justice, which Anne helped found in the 1970s along with the Reverend C.T. Vivian and other organizers who had been leaders in the civil rights movement. SOC's purpose was to keep stressing organizing as a fundamental principle of effective social change. Its members felt organizing's importance to social change work must always be kept front and center, especially in the minds of activists. The founders of SOC urged activists not to succumb to quick programmatic temptations as the obvious next steps to the incredible victories that organizing had brought about in the aftermath of Brown v. Board in 1954. They knew it was mass-based organizing that had made the civil rights movement happen and that it was such organizing that would continue to be the necessary foundation for any future victories. They wanted to train organizers who could move about the South and keep the movement going. Anne always had a strong cadre of local organizers who worked with her in different towns and cities across the South. She did not want to be seen as a public intellectual, whether it was with Maddie Jones in Louisville, Judy Hand and Scott Douglas in Birmingham, or Gloria Furman and Ron Chisholm in New Orleans. She knew how important networking was in her organizing. Jim Dunn would say, we must build a net that works. I was not a seasoned organizer in the mid 1970s. I was just beginning my work at St. Mark's Community Center. When I was hired, St. Mark's was a recreation program serving neighborhood youth from Treme, one of the oldest African-American communities in the United States. It was in Treme that I first heard of a group of neighborhood residents who were forming an organization to address issues of housing, jobs, and constant police harassment. I knew I wanted to be a part of that effort. Ron Chisholm, Joyce Laws, Jim Hayes, and the Herbert family were the lead organizers behind the development of the Treme Community Improvement Association, TCIA. They were about developing leadership and enhancing residents and their institutionally based supporters like myself with a sense of the community's power if organized strategically. Part of their long-term strategy was to expose their members to other organizing efforts, not only in New Orleans, but around the South. I began to travel to Birmingham to SOC meetings. For me, these trips were like going to school. They were definitely an education. SOC was a classroom and the teachers were legendary. People would come from all over to SOC meetings. Dr. Jim Dunn from Yellow Springs, Ohio, came to SOC meetings. So did C.T. Vivian from Atlanta and SCLC. Ann Romain, an organizer who worked among coal miners in Appalachia, Lynn Wells with the National Anti-Klan uh, Network, and such luminaries as Hosea Williams, Majeska Simpkins, and Reverend Fred Taylor all from Atlanta, but the prime mover behind Sock's influence was the example and charisma of Ann Braden. Because it was Ann who founded Sock, others wanted to be a part of it because Ann believed, you believed, or you believed in Ann. I asked Ron Chisholm once, what was it about Ann Braden that stood out in his mind? He said, because she never threw anyone away. Anne worked with everybody. 
He said, I try to follow that principle in my own work. Anne struggled with the current emphasis on affinity groups. It was a new notion to her. She resisted being slotted into the white group. She had complained, you mean after spending my whole life organizing white and black people to learn how to come together, I now have to meet with just white people? We assured her that is not what was meant, but people of color, especially black people, were saying that they needed their own spaces where whites were not present to discuss certain dynamics not meant for white people to hear. And they went on to say, and whites need to do the same. Thus was born European descent in 1986. The idea was when we would come back together, we would be stronger. Maybe Anne was right. Today, affinity groups are in danger of becoming an end in themselves, maybe even at the expense of movement building and community-based organizing. I remember an evening in the early 2000s after an undoing racism workshop in New Orleans at Marjorie Freeman's in my house in New Orleans where Ann and Reverend C.T. Vivian were present. Others were all also there from the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond's local organizing community in New Orleans. We began to tell stories of which of how the People's Institute was founded at CT's home in Atlanta with Anne in attendance. As the night wore on, Anne and CT began to reminisce about their own history together, working with Dr. King and other heroes of the movement. Alcohol flowed freely amongst us and inhibitions loosened. At some point, I chose to just squeeze down into a corner and listen. What a rare and in retrospect, cherished moment. I was thinking of my own upbringing in the segregated towns of Macomb, Mississippi and Helena, Arkansas in the 1950s and 60s. I thought to myself, what a blessing it was to have such a twosome in our house. Even as the weather that night worsened to the point that the New Orleans airport was shut down, I would not have wanted to be anywhere else. CT and, and Ann had to sleep at our place overnight, one on the couch and the other on a pallet on the floor. Another memory comes to mind with Ann. She called me in one, one evening at what felt to me like the middle of the night was probably only close to midnight. She was excited. Let's make a movie, she proclaimed. Let's do a remake of Mississippi Burning, but this time tell the truth about what really happened. The one out now, she said, makes the FBI seem like heroes. She went on for a, a while before we admitted it was probably not going to happen. Anne had certain principles of organizing that are as important to understand and live by today as ever. She called them her five essentials. Number one, you must understand racism. Racism destroys democracy and we live in a race constructed nation. Number two, change comes as oppressed people. Peoples organize for change and make demands. You can't expect to legislate racism away. You can't educate it away. You must organize from the bottom up until the nation changes. Number three, when African-American communities organize, the nation trembles. Number four, no one group can do it alone, but masses of people working together can build a movement that is anti-racist. Five, we must regain the audacity of the 60s and continue to dream the dreams of justice. If there is an organizer's hall of fame, Ann Braden belongs in it. 
if there are those whose names we must not forget, hers is one of them. Cheryl Nunez, and I have spent nearly the last three decades as the senior institutional officer for what's variously been referred to as multicultural affairs or DEI, equity and excellence. Um, and uh, today I serve at the College of Worcester as Vice President for Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity. But I got um, an important start in this work at Northern Kentucky University uh, beginning in 1995. I was the Director of the Office of Affirmative Action and Multicultural Affairs. And uh, I invited Ann Braden to come and deliver our, let's see, I have it written right here. Oh, the annual Martin Luther King Jr. celebration that spring. So, um, you know, she joined us many times thereafter. She became, in fact, a fixture at the university and one of us as a visiting faculty member the following year. But I believe it was the spring of 97 when we sort of first introduced her to the NKU community. Ann Braden was, you know, such a font of knowledge and history, especially the history of freedom movements and, and social justice and racial justice organizing. Um, the goal was to leverage her presence in Kentucky uh, for teaching and learning at Northern Kentucky University. And so um, working closely with the um, African-American uh, studies department, which you led and with the honors program, uh, I was able to uh, sort of help arranged her her role as a visiting professor in our honors program and of course Anne uh, you know was was quick to say she was no professor right but it turns out she was every bit the professor she ended up calling upon her vast network of um, colleagues and fellow freedom freedom fighters uh, and one of them included Julian Bond who got on a call I believe uh, with you and me and and head of the honors program and of course Ann and said look Ann I'll help you sort of refine your curriculum and I'll I, I want to uh, refer you to the use of a textbook I've written for that purpose this was Julian Bond and uh, so Anne ended up titling her honor seminar, The Civil Rights, Anti-War and Labor Movements, A View from the Inside. And indeed it was a view from the inside. Anne has mentored a generation of racial justice and social justice freedom fighters, including of course, Julian Bond himself. Uh, Carla Wallace and Angela Davis. And that's just to name a few. And so um, it was largely based on their fondness for Anne that I was able to persuade them and many others to come to the university 
uh, as as you know keynote uh, lecturers and and to really help make the university for a while the site of this kind of dialogue in the state of Kentucky. Um, I believe Angela Davis came the following year in 98 um, to do a keynote lecture at the university. Ann Braden, of course, introduced her. By then, Ann was a visiting professor and introduced Angela um, to the campus community. And if I'm not mistaken, Angela spoke about how uh, she had known Ann Braden since she was a child in Birmingham, Alabama, Angela being from Anniston and uh, a good friend of Angela Davis's mother. And I was struck by the fact that Angela Davis credited Ann as being her mentor, at least a mentor in um, what it meant to become a social justice activist. And, and since Angela's acquittal, um, she had joined or had founded with Anne's husband, Carl Braden, the Alliance, National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, and shared it um, for years, but she was involved in it for years, becoming a chair emeritus at, at one point. Um, but that work also brought Angela Davis to Kentucky. Uh, and um, so she, she had ties to the region and I'm sure that it didn't hurt our opportunity to bring her to Northern Kentucky University. I, I think there was scarcely a notable in the in freedom movements who who um, came to the university while Anne was there, who was not introduced by Anne, and who did not come in part to pay homage to Anne. So Anne really functioned as a magnet for the university. Um, she signified, I think, um, to the broader justice community, something unique about our uh, university in as much as we were the first institution to recognize Anne as a font of, of knowledge and, and wisdom. Um, after she uh, taught at Northern Kentucky University, she eventually went on to the University of Louisville where they founded the Anne Braden Center. But I, I am very proud of the fact that uh, we were the first to recognize her for her um, her great wisdom. Once again, while we provided a lot of sweat equity um, as advisors, Anne Braden was the North Star, very much an inspiration for um, for the work of Star, for its vision, and um, it was. I believe at the end of its first year, STAR, which at the time was the only truly multiracial, authentically multiracial student organization at the university, certainly the only espousedly anti-racist one, um, at the end of its first year, won an award as the best new student organization uh, in all the college and um, eventually its founding president, the student you are um, referring to, won the Board of Regents Award, the President's Award, sort of every award of, uh, possible. This in the context of work that was decidedly activist and at times 
called into question um, the actions of the institution itself. And that tells us that there was just no denying um, that the work of Starr and indeed the broader work that Ann Braden uh, represented uh, were inherent parts of what it meant to be educationally excellent, what it meant to be um, truly community engaged as we, we were, um, what it meant to educate, what it meant to teach and learn. So, you know, the, the sort of um, the recognition from all sides, the community that flocked to the university for lectures and artistic events and plays and excursions, um, faculty and staff who enjoyed professional development led by some of the folks we've named and certainly our students. Um, all seem to find some common cause around uh, around this emerging um, spirit of justice that I think we both had something to do with. Two really interesting anecdotes. The first is just an example of the charm with which Anne could tell the truth. So Anne told truth in a way that um, warmed my heart. I recall, and I can't tell you the actual event, but it was a gathering of, I believe, administrators, university administrators, maybe the president's cabinet, where Anne spoke, and this was early in her time at the university, um, and said, you know, um, now I'm talking to you as a white person, she said in her, her Southern draw, I'm talking to you as a white person, I'm talking to white people. And you know, the problem with us is we think we need to run everything. I mean, after all, that's what it means to be white, she said. And I thought, um, you know, it's not an easy task being quite so direct, so blunt and so honest with as much charm as Anne could deliver. Uh, but it was undeniable. I think the it, it, it was warmly received because it came from the mouth of, right, a, an important, um, an important figure that we'd all like to emulate in some way or another. So that was, that was memorable. Um, she also, I think during that gathering said something that has stuck out for me because it, it it's just, um, it's so direct and, and so concise. She said that, um, when black people move, it's referring to this country, our peculiar history. When black people move, the entire axis of society shifts. Black people move and, and you know, the society shifts on its axis. And that's certainly borne out by history, but it also speaks to a kind of um, centrality of Black studies, um, you know, the, the Black or, you know, African perspective uh, to what is known and worth knowing to what it means to be human, to what it means to be a healthy society. Um, 
and and that's just stuck with me always. The the last, the final memory of Anne um, is from her funeral, where many of those students from STAR uh, were gathered, along with people from every walk of life. There in a an African American church in Louisville. Um, upper middle class white men um, you know old um, black church women lesbians and 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 queers of every background all gathered in one spot all embracing each other all weeping in the face of the same sort of um, loss. And maybe it was one of the speakers there who said, um, we are not supposed to be here together like this. And we owe it to both Anne and to Carl Braden that we are. And I can't help but think that we often fail to recognize the power of even a single life in reshaping the world. But Anne, even in her death, um, left in place a world worth fighting for. And it was, it was visceral in that room. And it's, it, it inspires me every day that which is not meant to be is possible and must be fought for continuously. And that is the legacy of Anne Braden. I am giving this speech um, to support Anne and uh, our um, any and all initiatives at NKU to honor her her legacy there, her being able to teach for 10 years, 11 years um, at this university. And um, I think of her when I met her in the fall of summer, fall 2005, she was a really frail old lady. Um, and I didn't know who she was because she was just sitting in the background of our students together against racism meetings. And then I asked um, one student, I was like, wait, who is this person? Because she, she looked um, essentially like my grandmother. Uh, uh, my grandmother lived with me as a child. She was a, a resident of um, Mount Vernon, Kentucky. Um, and she has Boone lineage. And she would always talk about her, um, you know, family, uh, white family founding Kentucky, you know, at Boonesboro. Um, she didn't have an, an analysis of racism, uh, like Anne, um, but she, you could tell that she was a daughter of the South, my grandmother. Um, the way she talked, she talked just like Anne did. She talked slowly. Um, Anne talked slowly. She would listen. She would ask questions, um... And that's how my grandmother was, because I think being a Southerner is about life being slow because life comes at you fast. And 
it's easier it, when life is coming at you fast to take things slow. Uh, I think John Wooden, Coach John Wooden made a, a saying that was similar to that. Um, and uh, in, in her biggest, um, you know, or first case that we most people know her by, she helped a veteran. She helped a World War II veteran, Andrew Wade, a Navy veteran from World War II, and his family um, buy a house in a white neighborhood because he was not satisfied nor he was did not accept the housing options in the very small part of Louisville where black people were, were shoved into and stuck through several different strategies. And um, he fought in the first part of the Double V campaign, which was started during the war, the World War II. It started with victory over fascism abroad. But the second part is something that my grandmother married my, she married into my family. Uh, we're not from Kentucky. Um, we're from Ohio. Um, uh, Virginia and Maryland, but she knew our family's history and Southerners are big into lineage because we're religious folks. Um, Sunday is a big day to go to church. Um, my grandmother went to church. Both of my grandmothers went to church. My other grandmother was Southern, but she is nothing like Anne and nothing like my other grandmother. But she, even that one was a, a Southern Baptist minister. So I grew up with a credible pressure to go to church um, myself. And I, from a youngest, my memories, they made me do memory verses and I was good at them. I, I don't know. I don't really remember. I mean, I do have memories of it being in um, Jasper Bend, Kentucky which is south of Mount Vernon, um, where my other grandmother lived uh, in the mountains, in the hollows. Um, and um, we saw rattlesnakes and uh, she lived in a trailer that went, that was being held off of a mountain uh, with cinder blocks. And I was so scared um, because just even off the main road, it took six miles to get back into Jasper Bend. And then I think the next biggest place that I can remember is Lake Barkley and then Somerset. It just, it, I grew up in Amelia in Cincinnati and you know where you are, you have signs. But when you're in Kentucky, the South, you don't, you know, and this is the eighties, nineties. So we don't have GPS yet. We don't, we're, uh, asking for directions men <laughs> famously would not ask for directions and drive forever my dad was one of those he was oh man but uh rg bunker imitator and so but my grandmother educated me in my home because i was raised by three strong women um and my father was n did not like women and he was an Archie Bunker imitator. He hated, he, 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 he thought women were to serve him. And I was, I could not believe it because I, I was like, wait, there are three strong women here. And dad, we're outnumbered and we're a military family. Um, and uh, we're expected to serve, you know, maybe like Andrew Wade, you know, people haven't, gone into his story. I find that odd because of how Anne talked about it. Because he didn't, because he, par I think maybe arrogance because he just participated in core uh, during the 60s. But I, I look at him, I look at his picture in front of his bombed out house and I see the look of like anger, pain, frustration at a country that he would defend, that he would defend and put his life on the line and he can't come home and find a house of his own that he can afford. He had a plumbing business 
that's always an afterthought that this man had a wife had a daughter that Anne looked after like we're friends with I, I don't know but had a relationship with because Anne felt responsible because she was fighting the second part of that double V campaign she just didn't wear a uniform because they didn't let women or they were secretaries in fact, I have a neighbor. Actually, she's one of the first female officers that served in the Air Force in the 50s. And she is a trailblazer. And you could tell why she did. She had to deal with a lot of sexual harassment. And um, she tells me a lot of stories about serving in, in that campaign as a woman and just being a um, piece of meat and someone to get food. And how sad that was for her that she's even devoted the rest of her life to USOs or American Legions because, like all veterans, we feel responsibility to this country. We feel deeply about its safety, not just when we, we wear our uniforms where it's our mission, but when we get out. I know that's really one of the biggest drivers of being an anti-racist and seeing what Anne was doing and seeing, you know, she had a mission, you know, she had a mission in life. And I had met Dr. Washington and we take, I'd taken his classes before and he's the one that introduced me to her because he was in introduced to her in 1975. And so without Dr. Washington, I don't ever meet her. And I am just a student at NKU and I, I get my college degree and I move on to become a teacher. I was uh, on the track, the social studies track. But after, after my, I started, I, I took black history, a black history and film class in the, the summer of 2005 with Dr. Washington, it changed my life. About It made me think about racism and it put me on the path to meeting Anne and, and figuring out, hey man, you know, Anne and me, we're Southerners, you know, and I think Anne and Carl, Carl being from Indianapolis, not Indianapolis, but I mean, Southern Indiana and Cincinnati is a temporal zone where we were sympathetic to the South. Um, historians, I think, have done a bad job on um, really examining Cincinnati as a place where uh, if it had military targets, the war would have been different because of John Hunt Morgan's uh, invasion attempt. And he essentially did what Lee did with larger numbers at Gettysburg. But there was nothing to attack here but uh, Fort Wright, Fort Thomas, and in barricades around Cincinnati if you got across the river. But there was nothing to attack. Most of the Union that fought from this state, they came from northern Ohio. They were northerners because they were like, hey, we need to defend the country. Cincinnatians were more sympathetic to the South. Like, yeah, we don't really mind about slavery. We don't really mind about racism. You see it in our city today. And Anne and Carl, they are from this temporal zone in Louisville and Southern, Southern Indiana, where it's the Ohio River. I mean, depending on where you are as a black person uh, before or after 1850, the Ohio River is freedom or the possibility of freedom. Um, after eight, the Fugitive Act law of 1850, um, black folks had to get to Indiana because the whole North was militarized and essentially deputized to um, corral escaped slaves. So Cincinnati was avoided in a place where I'm talking to you right now. I'm talking to you from 
Great Miami. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I think you see it now. Would have been significant in that escaped black folks would have been coming up this river because it goes up to Dayton. And it would have taken the tracks of dogs away. Uh, water does that. If you read um, any escape attempts, you read them, read the primary documents of them. His water was important. It was a landmark. It was a good way to um, figure out distances because we, again, we're, this is almost 200 years ago, 300 to 400 years ago. So people have to use memory. But <clears throat> Julian Bond and so many other people, they called Anne and Carl abolitionists. And I think about that statement because it, it it's so significant because people still do not understand the abolitionists at the time and that there's so many things that it just wasn't possible in the south openly yet you had poor white people and poor white, black people living together especially in Appalachia because I saw them uh, when I would go down there when I was a kid in Mount Vernon and Jasper Bend and other places. And there was harmony, you know. Uh, Frank X. Walter, Walker is talking about, talked about Af Afrolasian uh, writing. He writes that way, but he seems to be maybe the only one when that kind of that kind of, those kinds of relationships are why you got the Supreme Court case of the, the Loving decision in 1968, where um, interracial marriage was officially um, ruled constitutional, essentially. The Loving case, there's a recent movie about it, where a white man marries a black woman and they're imprisoned. Uh, and they have to fight all the way to the Supreme Court to have what we've had in this country since the beginning of, t of the time of white folks, black folks, or whoever's come over here and then kept coming. You had black and white cooperation. But laws that were created in colonies like Maryland and Virginia changed all that 1600s and 1700s, especially 1705 and there is this separation that's been this way up until today because it's about money it's about power control wars you name it um and saw her life as a continuum that she fought for freedom every day and she fought for it with her whole heart. And because of that, she just lived with integrity and goodness that I could see in my grandmother of that, you know, the South, I think the South, it shames itself because it knows, and especially Kentucky knows that it migrated towards the Confederacy after the Civil War just because of the power of Jim Crow. And Kentuckians know better as Kentuckians talk about, like as a good people, fundamentally a uh, cooperative people, um, a people of hope, even though it is a very poor state, a very uh, geographically divided state, yet, it's been so significant in American history with its politicians that is extremely underrated, um, that has even into Anne's history where Louis B. Nunn, a governor, and um, Nunn Hall and so many things are named after him at NKU, um, tried to run her out of the state, her and Carl. 
and he had her arrested um, in Eastern Kentucky, and um, uh, and uh, he they went through a third trial, third sedition trial, and I don't know how terrorized they must have been, but I can't imagine what it was like. Um, in 1967, of, this is the third time uh, Carl goes to jail the second time. I mean, Anne, the only reason why she doesn't go to jail is she's pregnant or she's a woman. She she was a, f you know, fellow traveler that because of her civil, their civil, civil right, rights work, were called communists. So, but in 1967, it was laughable. It was completely laughable, and the case was laughed out of court. But in 1954, it was not. And that was McCarthyism. And there are documents to prove that if Nixon didn't have um, Watergate, they were, hoping, they were hoping for another House Un-American Activities Committee, or like it, because Louis B. Nunn and his brother were Nixon operatives. They were confidants. They were even more confidential than Governor George Wallace. And that man was won electoral votes that um, Nixon needed in 68 and 1972. And so this powerful man that uh, is powerful before he's a governor, he runs for governor in 1962, 63. And he is George Wallace before jo George Wallace is. He is making commercials that is appealing, are appealing to Kentuckians, our religion, our flag, and the American flag. And for Kentuckians, we love our flag. We love that blue. And that's why it, the University of U. University of Kentucky is blue, and we we tend to hate University of Louisville for no reason other than the fact that it's not UK. It's irrational because Kentuckians are very prideful people or proud people. Uh, don't like being disrespected, even when they're really, really wrong. As Anne always noted of the uh, Hamilton, the the first prosecutor in 1954 in the Wade case when they had no evidence of sedition of any conspiracy and it was just white supremacists and even the cops probably knew who did it because they were shooting and terrorizing the Wades at all hours of the night even Carl and Ann pulled guard duty guard, guard duty like in the Marine Corps where we would stay up all night usually and 10 or 12 hours and we would guard the other guys. They were guarding the Wade's house. So they weren't just the house purchase. They were a continuum. You know, Anne started out as, you know, a good person, a liberal, a liberal Jim Crow um, participant, you know, where they had their own customs, debutantes, and golf clubs, and politics, and they felt like, you know, there's nothing wrong with the South, Jim Crow, you know. It's okay for black folks to be um, second-class citizens, and for black folks to not be able to vote, and to have literacy tax, poll taxes, literacy tests, and basically no constitutional rights. And um, she was okay with it, you know. And but it was through her education, um, where she went to women's schools, um, who she considered finishing schools. They were not education. She was, I think, she was probably bored at them because they were probably teaching people how to do a tea, an afternoon tea, instead of challenging the young women in that uh, institution. But she had mentors that she corresponded with that were in other parts of the country, New York. So she was still a Southerner, but she was able to start searching. So 
start searching because she's like, you know what, maybe the Jim Crow South is not okay. And then one of the most seminal events in her life is not even Bull Connor's uh, police brutality as she's a reporter. She sees this, wait, she sees this almost two, 20 years before 1963 and his dogs and his police hoses and Dr. King's a youth march there, which was horrendous. She saw him doing what he was doing in the early 1940s, but it wasn't enough for her to do anything about it until, um, you know, she gets a job in Louisville where um, it's a better job than she had. Those jobs were when she was really in college that she really didn't see a future in, although she was, I mean, Kentuckian, but she was, as much as she loved Kentucky, her love for Alabama was just as much. You know, she bleed, she bled Alabama red. I mean, she did. You could tell I was just there in Montgomery and talking to people there and it just felt like, yeah, it's felt so familiar. You know, I've never been to Alabama, but been to other parts. But it's just like, because Anne, Anne would have taken a better job anywhere in Alabama. It was just the um, University of Louisville, or not Louisville, the Louisville Times, I think, hired her. And she had family here. And um, she, she had family. And she, she gets this job as a journalist in a Jim Crow city that is the most liberal Jim Crow city. It's probably, um, you know, unimaginable now, but these folks were like, you know what? Black folks really got it really, really good. You know, you could see the river, but you still had housing discrimination to, um, housing discrimination that was as bad as, um, her job here in Louisville was significant um, because it challenged her um, in uh, the, um, well, it was run by a liberal organization and um, it gave her a chance to write. It gave her a chance to write more and she's in the same newsroom as her future husband. And uh, they must have bonded pretty hardcore because he, Carl, meeting Carl must have been like a, a hurricane because the guy was a union activist and, and um, a mine worker. Um, and he went into some of the most dangerous places in Appalachia, Kentucky, Harlan, Kentucky, West Virginia. In the civil rights movement, he went into the worst places um, in Mississippi. I mean, the civil rights movement kept him out of the Freedom Summer because I think they were just afraid that he would take it over because he didn't need a movement to go to Mississippi to tell people, hey, let's go vote. He's like, Mississippi is wrong. This is the South. We should be doing what's right. We have a way about ourselves that is supposed to be slower and it's supposed to, um, it's supposed to value people. You know, it's supposed to be friendly. It's supposed to be accommodating. Um, we're supposed to have, um, we're supposed to have, um, um, we're supposed to take care of each other, you know, and respect each other, you know, and Jim Crow is not that. You know, Jim Crow is, Jim Crow is the opposite of that. I mean, uh, Carl and Ann knew the South, uh, when white guilt was intense, where, I mean, taking, kidnapping black folks and bringing them here to work in the South, which is, has some of the hardest humidities variants in the, I mean, definitely in the 
this country, but even the world. Even Kentucky is a part of four different geographical uh, regions itself. It has two regions of mountains. It has the bluegrass. Um, and it has, um, it has one more, but I can't think of it. But to wrap it up, I just want to say that um, Anna and Carl, they weren't, they didn't become great activists by their own self. They were a part of a tradition of white couples that goes back to the Southern Conference of Human Welfare in 1938. And this um, organization is the first Southern Conference organization that be becomes SCLC, where we get Dr. King uh, leading, well, it, it didn't exist when the Montgomery bus boycott was here, but what would become the civil rights movement vanguard, at least ministers. And so um, he, he was, um, so they were um, trained by people from that organization, the, like Dombrowski, Miles Horton and his wife, the Highlander Folk School. The Highlander Folk School probably is the one reason why we had a civil rights movement because Dr. King didn't believe it was possible. Didn't believe it was possible until he might have even met Ann. I mean, in a car ride in 1957 because he didn't believe that the South could ever change. He was cynical about it and he had reasons to be. The violence, especially, he he read the papers, he saw the Wade case, you know, and he has a f prominent family in Atlanta. But the Southern Conference Human Welfare is started by the courageous Southern whites, you know, and honorary whites like Theodore or Frederick Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor. Eleanor, she sat in the middle between the white and black sections in Birmingham because, or Montgomery, or for, or Birmingham. She sat in the middle in a, a classic uh, picture of the enforced segregation to be the bridge. And then you get the, the Bradens uh, mentored by folks like her, um, uh, Larice Charlton, she was a federal judge. Um, the Durs, um, uh, the Pattersons, they were mentored. They were encouraged. They were part of a, a, a movement, a hospital movement that I, me and Dr. Washington just presented on about helping desegregate um, hospitals in Kentucky because two to th three black men died on the floor of a segregated hospital. So her life, her life was a continuum. And even after the civil rights movement somewhat explodes or implodes, Dr. King is assassinated. She's still doing the same things versus the white folks that leave and then become yippies and basically turn their backs on the movement and become consumers and become a lost generation in the 70s and 80s because it was just a phase for them. It was just something that they were doing. That was the times. If it was today, they would be, it would be on Instagram or TikTok because it's just young folks being young folks, courageous, but you have to keep going. You have to have a strategy. You have strategies, campaigns. And Anne didn't need any movements to tell her to keep going and have integrity to keep fighting. You know, she lost Carl in 1975 and uh, she kept going. She became a part of the Angela Davis campaign free Angela Davis and I talked to Angela Davis a couple years ago at her 
her one she was doing one of her many book tours she's an eminent um scholar now but i talked to her and this was at wright state locally here and i had her sign my book long live ann braden you know because and i asked her a question they had a q a in front of this whole basketball arena i was like what was it like because Ann was a mentor of mine. And she was like the kindest person. Ah, just kind. And Angela talked. Talked at length and it was just, I cried. Because it's like, she's still here. You know, her, her example's still here. It's in this book. I mean, the Bradens worked with everybody on the political spectrum. They kept going in the black power movement they were friends with Robert F. Williams, United States Marine Corps, that, that went back to 1950, the 50s, when he was fighting the Klan, when he was the leader of the NAACP in Monroe, North Carolina, him and his wife. And he was chased around the world by this government because he was so effective. I think partly because he was also a Marine too. I mean, his picture, uh, of Tim by Timothy Tyson uh, on the cover is pretty uh, iconic to me, him and his wife shooting a gun because self-defense is needed. Even though you need, you need, um, um, you, you need non-violence. These are all strategies. You need Robert F. Williams because he, he was years before or ahead of uh, Malcolm X, you know? And you needed to fight in the North and you needed to fight in the South. And you needed to have flexible um, uh, tactics. And as a Marine, Robert F. Williams knew that. I knew that. I mean, that's what we do in the Marine Corps. We adapt, we overcome. But uh, the Bradens knew it too and sought him out to help him. And I do recommend Dr. Tyson's book because it shows you the Bradens were everywhere in the South and they scared everyone. And it didn't matter if you were white segregationists, if you were George Wallace crying about them on the morning, the Today Show with their picture because he's afraid because he, they helped end Jim Crow or you're a black liberal that like Andrew uh, Young and others in SCLC warned SNCC, an organization that Ann and Carl helped uh, Ella Baker found, they were warned away. And the Bradens were considered honorary members of SCLC. Uh, and that was ahead of 200 other ministers. So there has to be, if integration means anything, if integration is what Ian, Dr. King, and all those fought for the Black Power Movement as well. If it means anything, especially today in 2013, I'm getting old, 2023, it means we have to be flexible. We have to be like, kind like Anne. We have to accept each other's flaws, and especially in the movement. Um, it has to have staying power. Organizations have to have staying power. Um, and we have to keep working, you know, and some people can't, can't do the same things all the time. And, and, uh, but we have to keep going, you know, because Dr. King believed in a moral arc of the universe. And that was bigger than this country. It was bigger than any Jim Crow, racism, sexism, ableism, any college institution, state, country. Because that, we are living in a short amount of time, short amount of time. Uh, someone said, we're like a blink of an eye and we only have that to make a difference. We don't have much time. 
the time is short because our perception of time is different. It's short. To Anne, to Carl, to those legends that brought down Jim Crow, we still think about them 60 years. It's been 60 years, you know, because of what they did, because it worked. It worked for justice, regardless of where they were on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's a challenge for all of us in our work ethic, in the movement, whatever it's called, whatever we need to do to make this world better, but especially a country that is still structured by race in making us, pushing us to the brink of the end of this country with my sister, she, we are part of a, a founding family. Um, that our ancestor was the youngest signer of the Declaration of Independence. And so my grandmother, that was like Anne, told me about him. And I've confirmed that. And, but my sister also heard those, those stories. And she happened to show up with her husband on January 6th to overthrow this government. So if it means anything, we have to keep working. We have to keep their memory alive. We have to write about them. Um, whether it's small or large, you know, I just think that Anne wanted the best for people. I just felt such an amount of goodness just even the hugger was um, amazing, I think. And, um, you know, that moral arc of the universe is where she is. You know, I don't know where that is, but it's here and it's something that we need to get onto, need to tap into and um, fight, fight for and um, adapt overcome um and work together and um that's what i have to say thank you so much to everyone at nku it's a place where i got my bachelor's degree and i taught uh for a short amount of time as an adjunct professor uh, it's a special place forever that honors building is special to me because i met ann there and her spirit there in the university still lives on. It even lived on when I tried to get her her named her name on the pond, and um, it was stopped because one of the young he was very young um, members of their student council said in 2006, "But wasn't she a communist?" <laughs> and she fought that her whole life and. Well, she fought it past the grave. And we could have gotten that lake named after her. But when you say communist in Kentucky, it's not good. So, I mean, even if it was, it was definitely not true, no one ain't. She was just a southerner, straight up. Just like me, just like Dr. King, just like Robert F. Williams, Angela Davis, um, even honorary Southerners, you know, because it's a way of doing life and integrity. Thank you for listening. All right. Bye.
I think that's sort of the way about racism, that the meaning, the meaning of our national life 